I got my present, so I feel like I should be able to go home now. Um, my students also know that I carry a pot of tea with me when I teach, and so you'll excuse me if you see me dip to the tea that's not quite well hidden over here. Um, I really appreciate you being here today. I know, um, you know that we have precious few afternoons where we don't have something booked, and in our department, those afternoons are always Wednesdays. So um, thank you for making the time to be here. It's certainly an honor to follow Leah Ceccarelli and Phil Howard, the two people who did these first. Um, Leah had me laughing um, in ways that I hadn't expected, and I loved hearing more about her life. She's here. Um, <laughs> Phil, I won't bother talking about because he's not here. Um, <laughs> But I think that the key is that there are four elements in, that um, are common to these presentations. And I just want to highlight those for a moment so that um, you have some context for the choices I made and what I'm going to tell you today. The first is that there's supposed to be some acknowledgement of the people who have contributed to our academic careers. And you'll hear a, a lot of that from me. The second is the story of our intellectual journey and our academic career to date. And David's given you a little bit of that. So there won't be a lot of repetition. The third is the idea or the topic that is the current focus of our scholarship. And the last is questions or challenges that we hope to pursue in the years ahead. So four components. And we've been told we can do whatever we want with those, which is my favorite kind of instruction. <laughs> um, I've been giving lectures for 23 years. I've given a lot of lectures to a lot of different sizes of um, groups. This one is um, challenging in a way that, that was pretty awesome and terrifying. Um, <laughs> But preparing for this lecture was a whole new experience, even given the fact that I bring my own life experiences into my classes a lot. I kind of veered toward first an Academy Awards acceptance speech genre, <laughs> and then to writing my own obituary. <laughs> and <laughs> neither of those seemed really appropriate. Um, so I decided to follow the advice of my very first teaching mentor, John Angus Campbell. And he told me to start with what you know. And so I did. And I entitled my talk, An Autoethnography of an Academic Life. So let me first talk to you a bit about what autoethnography is. To be clear, I am not an autoethnographer, but we're just going to pretend that I am for today. <laughs> um, I am, though, an ethnographer of communication. And for me, this, this means understanding, according to the people who I study, how they communicate, what that communication means to them, and then how the way they communicate is somehow revealing of the way they live their lives. And I believe that if you pay close attention to the way people communicate, you learn something about them more generally. So today what I do in doing an autoethnography is turn that ethnographic lens on myself. It's not the mode usually used by me, but it certainly is a mode used by scholars in, for instance, English and performance study, uh, performance studies. So, I don't mean to be saying that I do it quite like they do it. It's like autoethnography a la me. Um, for me, what it means is, is examining my life experiences as data that have rich meaning to me. So taking a step back and trying to look at my life. And by taking this stance on my journey, I've allowed the possibility that themes that I may not have thought of before would emerge, and that meanings that I may not have considered before might become apparent. And quite honestly, that happened. To be clear, as with any ethnographic project, my account here is partial. Um, you'll be happy to hear that you won't hear everything about me today. Uh, it is also the case that what I remember and what I remark upon and how I in interpret those things reflect my perspective. That's what was most meaningful to me. And as I know that my mother and father will be watching this, I want to be super clear that those interpretations and even those things that seemed important to me may not be what other people noticed. Um, and they may interpret them quite differently. Luckily for me, this is an autoethnography, and so I privilege my own experience. So as an ethnographer of communication, one place that I look for cultural meaning and one place that I really push my students, and I know at least one of them is here, has heard this last quarter, really push my students to look for cultural meaning is in stories. Um, many people, many scholars study stories and narrative across many, many disciplines. Um, and generally speaking, a story is quite simply a recounting of a sequence of events. As we know, stories can be fact, they can be fiction, they can be some combination. I'm going to stick to fact, as I, as I remember it. Um, the more compelling question, though, for me is, what do humans do with stories? And humans do some really interesting cultural things with stories. We say something about ourselves, our place in the world, 
And we also say something about the world that we share with our hearers. And so today, I not only start with what I know, ethnography, but I start with what I tell my students of ethnography to focus on, which is stories. And so I start with my story. For me, my story is inextricable from my family's story, and I want to tell you about them. My family is from Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, probably in these circles most famous for the, uh, being the birthplace of Jack Kerouac. But it's a mill city at the confluence of the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, and it's that mill city that brought my family there. My mom and her childhood friends, who she has brec breakfast with monthly, still, they had breakfast this morning, um, they joked that they didn't know they were poor because everybody else in the neighborhood was too. They only realized it later. My dad jokes about the implications of living in a cold water flat for bath night. Um, he doesn't laugh very much about the rats that he had to tend to. And in our house growing up, a mouse was a sure way to get my father out of the house. <laughs> my parents married in Lowell, Massachusetts, same church that my husband and I were married in many years later. And they bought a house in that city. I was born there, and I lived there until I was seven years old. I promise I'm not going to document every year. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, God. Um, but not long thereafter, not long after I turned seven, um, the neighborhood started to change, and a motorcycle gang moved in down the street. And my parents decided it was time to get out of the city. So we moved to the suburbs. I had never thought about social class until we moved to the suburbs. And even then, I didn't think about it in those terms. I only knew that I was different. My hair wasn't right. My clothes weren't right. I didn't carry the right bag. And from grammar school to junior high to high school, people didn't let me forget that. So I went from being a really vibrant elementary school kid in the city with people who were just like me to a very silent little girl in the suburbs who never quite fit in. I would go home and I would ask my mom, because I was like, what the heck is going on? Um, I would say, Mom, why don't, why don't I have those things that everybody else has? And she would say, honey, we may not be rich in money, but we're rich in love. That got me nowhere. <laughs> it got me far, but it didn't seem to get me far then. Um, but I'm, and so that's a little bit of my story of growing up. But the story of my family goes back a little bit further. Of my grandparents, who were all first-generation Americans, their parents had come here in the early 1900s, only one graduated from high school. My Irish grandfather, George Tagg, a big man, was a bartender, or a counterman, as it was listed in the census. My Irish grandmother, a woman with a twinkle in her eye till the day she died, Mary Duffer, Duffy Baxter Tagg, left high school to work in a textile mill when her father fell ill. My French-Canadian grandfather, Joseph Hervé Coutu, who changed his name to Harvey Kuchu. That's the way you say my name, by the way, Kuchu, because that's what he said. Um, he left school after his third time in sixth grade um, to join the Civilian Conservation Corps, sending his paycheck back to his family in Massachusetts. My Italian grandmother, Madeline Pozzi, graduated high school and worked her entire life doing peace, peace work in a textile mill. Each of their parents had left their homes because they thought they could have a better life in America. They had a life, of a, vi a vision of a life that could be better. These people, these grandparents and my parents, they loved me fiercely, absolutely fiercely, and I loved them back. I learned many lessons from them about mostly, really, doing what needs to be done, stepping up. My grandmothers in particular were extremely strong women, independent beyond their generations. And they counseled me early on that I could do whatever I wanted to do. They also told me I should do it before I got married. <laughs> huh. Um, well, those of, you who, those of you who know Dan know that um, my marriage has not hindered my self-expression. Uh, <laughs> my parents, Jane and Jerry Kuchu, both graduated from high school as did all of my aunts and uncles in that generation. The vision that their grandparents and their parents had was taking shape. Their lives were getting better. My father worked as a quality control engineer for defense contractors my entire, his entire life. 
uh, before you actually needed a degree to be an engineer. Knowing the little I knew about his work, I worried constantly, and those of you who know me know I do worry constantly about something, um, I worried constantly about war and the end of the world. I was a bright, cheery child. Um, <laughs> my mother worked as an executive secretary and a credit specialist. They reinforced the message of my grandparents that I could do anything I wanted to do. They taught me how to stand up for myself in the world. They wanted both my life and my brother's lives to be easier than theirs, and that was a mantra they repeated my entire life. And they saw the way for that to happen was for me to go to college. So at 17, when it was, I was time to go to college and I was deciding to go, I told my father I needed a year to find myself. <laughs> he said no. <laughs> I was 17, I was living under his roof, and he suggested that I not have a choice. Um, so, I, so he said if I wanted to find myself, I could at the local university, now the University of Massachusetts at Lowell, and so that's where I went. Um, I wasn't pleased, not one bit. My boyfriend told me I needed that year. Um, <laughs> I don't think that he had any idea at the time, and I certainly didn't, that 30 years later, I would still be haunting the halls of a large public university. And so this young woman, no longer young, who didn't want to go to college, started college. After my first year at UMass Lowell, I transferred to the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and that was a life-changing moment for me. I became the first woman in my family to earn a bachelor's degree. I had some distant uncle who had earned a degree as well, so I want to be clear, there was a male before me. Um, and along the way, I became inspired by two professors. One won't be a surprise to, for those of you who know me, Donald Carbaugh, an ethnographer of communication who studied here with our own Jerry Philipson. I sat in his class, and my whole world clicked into place. It's a pretty big statement. Uh, but, you know, I was 20. Um, <laughs> I spent much of my, at my time at UMass protesting, championing causes, being politically engaged, things that probably sound crazy to those of you who know me now. Um, and suddenly, I had a theory that helped me make sense of the frustration I felt every time I witnessed one of these things, and the most prominent conversation was about how everybody else was bad. I didn't get it. That didn't make sense to me. But this ethnography of communication, this way of thinking about the world, understanding people on their own terms, that was the explanatory piece to my world that had been missing. And all of a sudden, everything fell into line. Now, if you had asked Donald Carabot to describe me at the time, he would not have described a student who he thought was out protesting, championing causes, and being politically active, because I was silent in his class. I had a voice in the world. My parents had absolutely made sure of that. No one was going to take advantage of their daughter. I, but I didn't have a voice in the classroom at all. Um, at a mandatory one-on-one -on -one meeting with Donald Carbaugh, which was the only way he would have gotten me to his office, during my last semester in college, he looked at me completely bewildered. And he said, you're the person who writes these papers? <laughs> and I said, yes. He said, but you don't talk. And I said, no. He said, you should. <laughs> and so he challenged me, speak once, speak one, say one sentence a week in my class, please, for the rest of the semester. And so I had anxiety attacks, but I did it. Um, <laughs> and he helped me find my academic voice. He told me I had something to say. And if it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't have ever known that. That was my last chance. That was my last semester in college. He also suggested that I go to graduate school, and I informed him quite politely that I couldn't afford to do that. Um, he told me I wouldn't have to pay. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. Um, that opened up whole new opportunities for me, things I didn't know. I didn't know that you could go to graduate school and get an assistantship and not have to pay for school. Are you kidding me? And then I got to school and people were complaining? Are you really <laughs> kidding me? Um, so when people asked me what I wanted to do after college, I had an answer. I wanted to go to college again. <laughs> I wanted to go to grad school because I wanted to teach people about the ethnography of communication. That was my goal because in my mind, the more people who could see the world from others' perspectives, the more peaceful that world would be. It was quite simple. The other professor who inspired me that was probably not as obvious and there probably aren't that many people in the room who know him, his name was Vincent Bevilacqua. He was a curmudgeon of a rhetorician who would walk into the room with basically white gloves and note how nasty and dirty UMass was. I found him delightful. Um, 
I took several classes with him, and each, for each one, the required reading was The New Yorker. I had never seen that piece. I had never seen it before. And our, in our writing class, he would make us write pieces that could be published in The New Yorker. Um, I mean, I never tried, but theoretically. So why was he so important? Well, I thought he, I thought he was smart, and he thought I was smart, and that's a golden moment. Um, but he had a life-changing moment in my life, too. I trusted him. I had taken some classes with him. And so again, the last semester of my senior year, I figured I had to get some things done. After dropping it for an entire year, and, you know, two semesters, I finally signed up for public speaking. He was no Matt McGarity. Um, <laughs> Vincent Pavalacqua did things a little differently than most. Rather than having an assigned speech day, he would have a day that the speech was due. And then from that day forward, he would say, Ms. Cook, speak. <laughs> you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> and you had to dress appropriately. So, you ha so from the first day of speaking on, you had to come dressed to speak. Um, I got sick in the bathroom down the hall before every speaking day in that class until he called on me. That was fun. Um, and for one of the speech assignments, completely flummoxed. Couldn't write my name. So I went to class in sweats, trying to signal to him that I wasn't ready to speak. <laughs> Finally, I went to him and I said, I'm Professor Bevilacqua, I'm really sorry, but I can't seem to write my speech. He's like, yeah, whatever. You'll let me know when you're ready by dressing appropriately. And so I finally showed up one day dressed appropriately, gave my speech, didn't die. It was all fine. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, that semester, that very last moment of my college career, changed my life because, it, because of that finding of my voice. Between Donald Carbaugh's encouragement for me to actually speak in class and Professor Bevilacqua's faith that I could speak in front of the class, I actually wrote um, an entry for the student commencement speaker at UMass's graduation that year. My treatise on the value of liberal arts education did not win over where to party best at UMass, but <laughs> I gave it a shot. <laughs> <clears throat> Professor Bevilacqua stopped me in the halls not long before graduation, and he said to me very casually, so you're going to graduate school, right? And I said, oh, God, here we go again. And I said, well, I don't really know. I've heard you can get it paid for, but I don't think I can afford it. And he said, you won't have to pay for graduate school. I thought two professors can't be wrong. <laughs> I've since learned that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I took a slight detour in the into the corporate world. I decided not to grad go to graduate school right away. I didn't want to continue school just because it was a place I had been comfort become comfortable. That would be too easy. Um, so I went to work for a large co corporation that sold endoscopy equipment. <laughs> yeah. It was pretty exciting stuff. Um, I saw things I didn't ever want to see. <laughs> so not surprisingly, within a year, I applied to graduate school. Um, I had another conversation with my father about school, again sitting across from him in that home office desk at which he had told me I had no choice but to go to school several years earlier. He wondered aloud why I wouldn't choose an MBA or some more practical professional degree. I explained to him why I was passionate about communication. Although I did heed his advice and drive out to Amherst and ask Donald Carbaugh about job prospects because my father did not want me to go to college if I wasn't going to get a job. When it came time for me to make a decision about, about where to go, I was disappointed not to have an offer in hand from the University of Washington, where I would study with Professor Philipson. I was heartbroken. My father suggested that we take a tour of the other schools to which I had been accepted to see which felt like the best fit. Along the way, not in the easy way it happens now, I got a call. Um, it was like, I think my mother got a call, who called us at a hotel and left a message, and eventually, <laughs> three days later, um, but I got a call from UW with an offer. In the spirit of, be careful what you ask for, I, of course, became terrified. <laughs> Seattle, seriously, I mean, at that point, I didn't, I wasn't even sure there was running water out here. <laughs> um, I'm a New Englander, and this was way too far away from my Massachusetts home. And to top it all off, I would be almost 30 by the time I finished my PhD. I know it. So, 
So my father, who at one time wanted me to be an engineer, and then wanted me to consider an MBA, said three things that changed my life. He said, you're always just an airport away. You can always come home. And you're going to be 30 anyway. You might as well do what you want in the meantime. <laughs> It's true, he said those things. Um, mostly he was right, although you, at that point it took more than one airport to get from here to Boston. Um, but I got on a plane to Seattle and I came here where I had never been and where I didn't know a soul. My biggest fear in leaving was never seeing those grandmothers that I told you about in the beginning, that I wouldn't see them again. My grandfathers had already passed away and my grandmothers were an amazing source of um, support and love for me. The last person that I saw before my family took me to the airport was my Italian grandmother. She had given me a, a medal. She had just come back from Italy and she had given me a medal to protect me. And I remember her waving from the steps as, as we drove away. What I didn't know was that she would be dead before I arrived in Seattle. And so my first trip to Seattle was only a couple of hours long. My family and friends took bets about whether I'd come back. Um, I did come back, but I only brought two suitcases because I figured that way at Christmas, if I wanted to go home, it would be easy. Um, I tried to hedge my bets a little bit. The thing is, I loved graduate school from the moment I started it, even though I had no idea what most people were saying. <laughs> and I wish I was joking. Um, but I had learned some things. I had learned some things by being that kind of awkward kid who didn't fit in. And I had learned some things about being an ethnographer of communication. I know how to sit back and watch. I know how to bide my time and then pounce. And so I sat back and I watched. I wasn't sure that other people knew that watching was actually a good thing. And so in my very first graduate class, introduction to graduate study, whatever that meant, um, taught by Professor Philipson, who's here, so I shouldn't have said it quite with that <laughs> amount of. <laughs> um, hi. Um, who, by the way, I was thrilled to be working with, and that's even in my notes, that's not, I didn't just make that up. Um, I finally approached him, he was at the soda machine in the basement of Rate Hall, where he could often be found buying a diet cola. Um, and I, I very nervously went up, I, I called him Dr. Philipson, because Professor Philipson had too many R's in it for my accent at the time. And so, um, so, I, so I said, Dr. Philipson, I'm really sorry, I just want you to know that I'm paying close attention, and I'm really engaged, I just really don't understand any of your questions. <laughs> and being the socially supportive person that he is, he turned to me and he said, well, understanding the question is certainly important to formulating a response. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so at that point, I decided that maybe I didn't have to tell him everything. <laughs> My master's was pretty smooth after that. And my doctoral studies were going really well. I was so excited. I was writing a dissertation about a, a juvenile offender and victim mediation program um, sponsored by King County. And they would get these people together before any trial so that the kids could try to make some kinds of agreements with the people they had usually vandalized um, to kind of do some social good rather than just giving the kid a punishment. So I completed their mediator training, which was awesome. I spent a year securing um, IRB approval from the UW, and the day I got that approval, the county pulled its funding from the mediation center, and I had no dissertation. Yeah, I cried <clears throat> a lot. Um, so while I was crying in the hallway in the basement of Rate Hall, where the soda machine was, um, my colleague saw me. And at the time, when I was do working on that dissertation, Jerry Phillipson had 14 advisees. He calls us the Fab 14. <laughs> Um, those people are what got me through graduate school. Because those 13 other people, some of whom, quite frankly, I don't really think liked me, um, they could have just reveled in my bad fortune. We were competitors at some level, right? 14 of us, that's a lot of ethnographers. Um, but what they did instead was they found Jerry. It's like they mobilized forces and went on a find Jerry Phillipson you know, assault. <laughs> Within two days, I had a new dis dissertation. I wrote it on something that couldn't be taken away by IRB or funding. Um, I wrote it on the discourse about war that happened when, after Robert McNamara wrote his retrospective account of the Vietnam War. Somehow I ended up studying the discourse of war, an echo of my childhood fears, 
and of my undergraduate passions. I defended my dissertation in 1996, three days before I turned 30. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty happy about that. Um, as far as I know, I'm the only person in my family to ever get a PhD. In 1996, that same year, I applied for a three-year lecturer position in speech communication, the department that had granted my MA and my PhD. Recently married to my husband, Dan Nickel, sitting in the front row <laughs> in husky purple, um, I thought the position would be a great way to take a break, strategize my next career move, no doubt to some prestigious university in a tenure-track position. I didn't have any idea what I was thinking. Um, four factors converged to make my three-year stint a 17-year stint and counting. First, I loved teaching. That's why I started this in the beginning. I like the research, but I love the teaching. I was able to do and am able to do exactly what I said I wanted to do when I finished my degree at the University of Massachusetts, teaching the ethnography of communication to undergraduate students, sometimes hundreds at a time. <coughs> Second, I realized that I loved teaching here at UW in Seattle and that it worked perfectly with my life. I'm fortunate to have a husband who was willing to move across the country for a job that I thought was the job of my dreams. But when I sat back and was really honest with myself, I realized I already had the life of my dreams right here, so why would I mess with it? Third, my graduate mentor, Jerry Phillipson, became my informal faculty mentor, and I started calling him Jerry. <laughs> um, seemed more appropriate. His first piece of advice to me, almost as unhelpful as the advice by the cola machine, was make yourself indispensable. Awesome. Uh, that seemed like a really good idea, but I had absolutely no idea how I was going to do it. When he became chair of the faculty senate, he suggested that I join the Faculty Council on Instructional Quality. I had no idea what that was, but of course I said, sure. I was new. Um, <laughs> I, although I did not make myself indispensable in any way by being on that council, something pretty remarkable happened that changed the course of my career. At a meeting, the chair of the committee said essentially, although probably not quite as nicely, we need to figure out something about this lecturer problem at the UW. We're hiring too many of them. They couldn't get jobs elsewhere. That's the only reason they're taking these positions, and it's really lowering the quality of education. And I thought, does, does he not see me? <laughs> Fourth, I had found my academic voice. <laughs> and I had a vision of myself that did not fit this particular colleague's vision of lecturers. With the wise counsel of Jody, Jody Nyquist, a former longtime senior lecturer in the Department of Speech Communication and associate dean of the graduate school, I took a deep breath, which I didn't want to, and began to strategize. That year, 1998-ish, in collaboration with the Center for Instructional Development and Research and the Office of Undergraduate Academic Affairs, I ran focus groups and conducted a survey to find out more about lecturers, to see if they actually did take the jobs because they couldn't get one anywhere else, and to see how their teaching evaluations rated compared to other people's. I can talk to you about that during wine if you would like. Um, <laughs> I can tell you that the data that I collected didn't support the stereotypes I heard not only in discussions on the Faculty Council on Instructional Quality, but elsewhere at the university. Thus began a rather unexpected turn in my academic career. In the years that followed, I worked with the Faculty Council on Faculty Affairs to create the position of Principal Lecturer, the position I now hold. I worked with the Teaching Academy to allow lecturers to be eligible for the Distinguished Teaching Award. The first time I was nominated for that award, lecturers were not eligible for it. The teaching faculty could not get a teaching award. I worked with undergraduate academic affairs and then Vice Provost Steve Olswang to include lecturers in faculty fellows, an orientation about teaching for new faculty, which I was helping to run, but which my people were not invited to attend. <laughs> I worked with lecturer colleagues the deans in the College of Arts and Sciences, including Judy Howard, the College of Arts and Sciences College Council, and now Provost Anamari Kause, to clarify and utilize the position of principal lecturer more effectively across the entire campus. Currently, I, co -serve as, I serve as co-chair with Marcia Colleen on a provost-appointed UW task force on lecturers 
and as a member of a tri-campus committee on lecturers. My work on lecturers on this campus has been one of the most rewarding aspects of my career thus far. I've been able to combine my commitments to listening to others, understanding different perspectives, and having a vision of how things might be if we were able to set aside our preconceived notions of each other. Part of the reason I've been able to do this work, of course, is because I have had an extremely supportive academic unit to work in, in both speech communication and communication, with leadership from people like Barbara Warnick, Jerry Phillipson, Jerry Baldesty, and David Domke, who've made it safe for me to be an activist in ways that other lecturers have not had the luxury of doing. And of course, I have great colleagues also here. <laughs> <coughs> <clears throat> so, but at the end of the day, really, as many of you know, students and teaching are what move me, what gets me up in the morning on days that I really would rather play hooky. Um, I have taught over 10,000 students, undergraduate and graduate. I've taught large introductory classes of 450 people and small graduate seminars of nine. I've served on, on graduate committees. I've, as David said, mentored undergraduate theses. I've taught face-to-face, -face, <coughs> online, and in the hardship of Rome. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I still get nervous uh, when I prep a new class, and if I'm being quite honest, I still get nervous every single day um, that I, every single first day of class. If we could just jump to day three, it would be great. Um, my students would like it too, because it's like I'm on speed the first day. Um, but even with the sort of stress that can sometimes come with it, teaching is really what excites me, and students are what keep me so excited every day. Every year since graduate school, I've gone back and reread my statement of intent that I sent in with my application. Um, I know it. <laughs> um, I am not a hoarder. Um, I am probably the anti-hoarder. I'm, I'm looking to Dan for confirmation because I, I once threw out his favorite um, cast iron pan. So I, don't, I, I purge, I don't hoard, but I kept this. Um, and honestly, I had forgotten a long time ago what was written in it. But I was having a particularly low moment in my PhD program. And Jerry Phillipson, see, he, did say, he said some really good things during my program. He said to me, do you remember what you wrote in your statement of intent? I was like... No, that was like four years ago. And he said, I think you should go read it. I think you should remember why you're here. And I did that year, and I don't think he knows that I have reread it every year as a matter of course as I start the academic year. Because there are two important pieces in it that remind me why I do what I do. One is that I wanted to teach the ethnography of communication, that I wanted to spread the word. For me, it's like a gospel. People should know this, because if they know this, they can't have any excuse for just dismissing other people as evil. It just doesn't work. Second goal, a little harder. Um, I wanted to apply the ideas of the ethnography of communication to issues of human conflict. I've had opportunities to do that, but they've been smaller. I get do, in some way, get to do both of these things every day in my work. Teaching what I love is pretty easy. Getting students though, to see how the ethnography of communication relates to conflict and war, honestly, that can be a little bit more difficult. It's a leap, and it's not on the next test. Um, but I do try, one person at a time. Um, and I've also expanded that goal beyond the ethnography of communication to teach a course that is about communication approaches to the study of war. Because communication has something to say about war and how we get in and out of wars that other fields, no matter how logical, just can't quite grasp. I love seeing students embrace the notion of understanding people on their own terms. It's like a little thing clicks, and it's magic. Even if it's hard for them to do it all the time, and they say to me, gosh, you live like this? I said, except when I'm mad at somebody. <laughs> right? you know, so it's not like you can do that all the time, but it helps. Um, and I love seeing students embrace the notion that communication has something to say about war that other perspectives don't. Uh, both of these moments of learning, I think, are empowering. In addition to the classroom, I serve with two student-centered groups and have served with two student-centered groups on campus for quite a while. The Phi Beta Kappa Executive Board, some of whom are here, and the President's Advisory Council on Intercollegiate Athletics, some of whose members are also here. PBK is the oldest and most prestigious honor society in the country. I just said that like it was true. Um, <laughs> it is. Um, 
And honestly, when I was an under, you see, somebody just said, it is true. Um, <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, it was the only honor society I cared about joining, the only one. And I got a bunch of offers, but remember my I can't afford it mantra from before, I wasn't going to waste my money. What I learned when I came here was that many students, because you know, in large public institutions like this, don't have a family history of people in Phi Beta Kappa. And so we don't have great um, acceptance rates. And that's crazy. Because Phi Beta Kappa is one of the few things that's still on my resume from when I was an undergraduate. My GPA isn't on there. That stuff doesn't matter. But people will go, oh, you're in Phi Beta Kappa? I'm like, yep. <laughs> so I try every year to encourage people, particularly first generation college students, to join PBK. And one of those people is sitting in the audience today. Yeah. See? Yay. Um, the Advisory Council for in on Intercollegiate Athletics, ACIA, is a somewhat different kind of committee. I'm on it for a lot of the same reasons. Um, as part of my role on that council, I serve on the appellate committee that decides whether student athletes who are not admitted through the normal admissions process should be admitted to the UW because of their special talents. Many of these student athletes, like me, first generation college students. It's important to me that we not forget what a difference an education can make in a person's life. That we maintain that vision of our university as a public university, even if funding doesn't always support that. And that as a public university, we serve our community. And one way we serve our community is by making its members better, by giving them opportunities. And so whether it's in Phi Beta Kappa, trying to sort of bolster up people who might not understand the prestige of something that they have been asked to participate in, or whether it's maybe looking um, a little bit more deeply at a student to see if he or she has the character to make it here, I want to help students succeed. And I want to give them opportunities that I had. I also get pretty excited thinking more broadly about teaching. And I've had a couple of opportunities to do that that I just want to touch on briefly. One is, even though I said I couldn't do it because I was only a lecturer, um, the former chair of the communication department, Jerry Baldesty, asked me to um, head up our undergraduate program. I said, I can't do that. I can't tell full professors I think what I think they should teach. And he said, you most certainly can. <laughs> and I said, all right then. <laughs> I'm coming to you if I get any flack. Um, that was an amazing opportunity in a couple of ways. One is, I realized he had a vision of who I could be on this campus that I didn't. And so maybe I was getting in my way a little bit. The second was that I had the re an opportunity to think differently about undergraduate education, more as a broad thing that you know, has many different working parts, rather than just what I was doing in my own class, or what my neighbors were doing in their classes. Um, that was a really amazing opportunity for me, and I'm grateful for it. More recently, I've been an associate director of the Communication Leadership Program. That's a whole new racket for me. Um, I focused there on developing curricula for professional master students. A totally different demographic with totally different goals than what I'm used to in the MA PhD program or in the undergraduate program. And you know what? Not totally, just somewhat different. I've also focused on training industry leaders to translate their experience into a classroom environment. This last fall, I had the fun and exciting, actually, opportunity to try to take the, what I knew about the ethnography of communication and I don't know, morph it, I guess, into some, that was a little dance move, morph it <laughs> into something that um, would be relevant for industry people, for people who are out in the world trying to discover, for various reasons, what's culturally important to a community. And that was really rewarding. As I think of what I'll do next, I'm hesitant to speculate. I never would have imagined my role with either the undergraduate program or the communication leadership program. But life here always has something new and exciting for me, and sometimes scary. Um, I envision change. I get fuzzy on the particulars. This has been a bit of a long story. But I told you in the beginning that people don't tell stories just to tell stories. They tell stories for purposes. And so what's my purpose? If I, make, if I tell a story in part to make a point about myself and the world I share with you, what point am I trying to make? Well, there's more than one. Mm -hmm. um, first, about me, I noticed some patterns that I hadn't noticed before. The themes of voice and vision are interwoven throughout my life. Since my great-grandparents, my family has had a vision of making a better life, and I am quite clearly, in a way that I hadn't fully appreciated before, the beneficiary of that vision. I was always taught that my vision of myself was much more important than anybody else's vision of me. 
And that lesson got me through not only grammar high school, high school, and junior high, gets me through some days here as a lecturer as well. I was taught early on to stick up for myself, so I developed a voice in some aspects of my life. Not until I was in college, however, did I develop an academic voice. I've used both of these senses of my voice in my work here at UW. And somehow I always come back to war. Fears when I was a child, protesting when I was a young adult, my dissertation, and a panel in military science last week <laughs> about the relationship between military and the media. So war somehow doesn't go away for me, and I don't think that it will. Finally, as an ethnographer of communication, though, I, tell you, I look at these stories not only to hear what the, hear sa the teller says about herself, but also what she says about our shared world. So here's what I'd like you to take away from my story. Not every student in our classes has an academic voice, but that academic voice can be taught and learned, and it's up to us to do it, because no one else is going to. It's up to us to notice our students and their stories. Their stories are how they tell you who they are. And if you don't pay attention, how can you teach them? We can change our students' lives by noticing them, by opening up opportunities to them that they may not be able to see themselves. That's exactly what happened to me. That is the only reason I'm standing here. I stand here talking to you using my academic voice because my family had a vision of what was possible for me. And at key moments in my life, people reinforced that vision and helped me to find my voice. So if you ask me what I'm going to do in the future, I'll tell you. I'm going to keep doing what I've been doing because maybe the one moment I take with a student on some random Tuesday will make it into someone's life story one day. Thank you.